So let's bow our head in prayer to our creator. Heavenly Father, you are the creator of all that is seen and unseen. We know that you exist. We love you. We need you in our lives. You created us to have a personal relationship with you. You provided the gospel of Matthew so we can learn about your son and his relationship with you and his relationship that he wants with each and every one of us here on earth. It's laid out here in black and white in the Bible, the love letter that you have left behind for us. So tonight we ask you to open up our eyes and open up our ears so that we can see your truth. We ask you to open up our brains and just pour in your wisdom. We ask you to give us compassion and understanding for those who do not believe for whatever reason that that may be. So Father, we ask you to give us the strength to, to take these words of wisdom, to take your truth and then share it with others as long as we have breath to share. So, Father, we ask you these things in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to go Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. And before we do that, I'm going to share five different slides. Um, again, I want to kind of review where we are. We're in chapter 8, but I want to go all the way back to chapter 1 again because I want this to really penetrate in your brains of how chapter one to chapter eight came to be. Okay, so I'm gonna share a few slides with you. And this is slide number one. Slide one, number one. Come. And it gives you chapter one. So that was the what? The plan of salvation, chapter one. Through Jesus, the Messiah, the one that, that was talked about all the way from the history of time, King, King David as well. So you have the angelic announcement also in chapter one of the conception of Jesus. So the angel went to talk to Mary. So that's in chapter one. Chapter two, we had the, the Magi. Uh, they reported about the sign and um, the birth of the king of the Jews. And they went to King Herod. And then after they left, King tried to what? Murder baby Jesus when he killed all the boys in the, in the town uh, that were two years and less. Um, he didn't want the king of the Jews to be in, in, uh, in, a, in a battle with him over power over people. Um, chapter 3, Jesus' baptism and the appearance of the Trinity at the time of baptism. God spoke. The dove came down as the spirit, and Jesus was there. So that was the appearance of the Trinity. So in chapter 4, we had the temptation of Jesus by Satan. And then after that temptation... By Satan, the angels came, and then his public ministry, Jesus' public ministry, began at the end of chapter 4. So you could see in the beginning with Saul being set up, his first ministry started after the temptation. And then chapter 5, you had the Sermon on the Mount begins, the Beatitudes. Jesus is looking for seekers who will turn into his disciples and then his followers. So that takes us through that. And then we're going to continue chapter six it's also a continuation of the sermon on the mount we talked about alms the giving of money or goods to those in need we talked about how to pray to the father the lord's prayer the disciples prayer we went through that and what is the true treasure heaven versus earth god versus cash that was all in chapter six again jesus public ministry is going full bore here on the sermon of the mount chapter seven continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. It actually concludes after chapter seven. And it says, do not judge. We talked about that. We talked about our relationships, not with, only with God, which is very important, but also with others, the first and second commandment, as we'll learn later. The golden rule was discussed in chapter seven. Talked about true and false disciples and prophets, wise and foolish builders. So that leads us up to tonight, which is chapter eight. Healing Jews, Jesus is going to start healing Jews and Gentiles, and he's going to address demons that possess people, okay? Does demon possession take, a, take a, is it true? Yes, it is. We're going to talk about it tonight. Again, chapter 8 continues. We're talking about the miracles of healing, 1 through 7. We're talking about the leper, then the centurion servant. It's a warning to Israel that their unbelief disqualifies them from the kingdom of heaven while the Gentiles are now, what, believing that Jesus is the Son of God. So first the Jews and then the Gentiles. We're going to talk about Peter's mom in chapter 8. 
or his mother-in-law, um, how she was healed. And then immediately she serves Jesus. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into that. Chapter 8, verses 18 through 22, it's the call to discipleship without comfort, without compromise. Talks about the son of man. This is the term Jesus uses most often to describe himself. The son of man, this is a term that will be used in the union of God and man in the person of Christ. And I took that quote from George Peters. And then continuing with chapter 8, we're going to talk about the miracles of power, the calming of the sea, which is power over nature, casting out the demons, power over the supernatural. Who has this power? Jesus has this power. Jesus is Lord, all of creation, even his humanity, the Son of Man. Jesus, Jesus gets tired. We're going to see that. Jesus is both human and divine. Demons understand the identity of Jesus as the Son of God and the future judgment from Jesus while most of humanity does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. This includes the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time. And I wanted you to sh just to show this picture to you, because I like to have the visuals. Here we have a visual just really about the story of when he, he takes the demons and casts them out of the human, and then they go into the pigs, and then they jump off the cliff. I just kind of wanted to see... You know, where this was, it was the Sea of Galilee, and I just kind of want to give you this visual of what Jesus did. So when we're reading it, you'll have it. The big thing here will be what were the response of the owners of the pigs, and what was the response of the person who was possessed. So there we have it. I wanted to give you that introduction before we actually start to begin our reading. So let's go to Matthew, and uh, we're going to pick it up with verse 1. Chapter 8, verse 1. So we're going to talk about Jesus um, cleansing the leper and the centurion. So here we have Jesus has the power and authority to make all of us unclean. You hear all that? Jesus himself has the authority to make us all unclean. So we're going to read how he's going to make the leper unclean, but he can take away our sins he can make us righteous. He has what? The authority and the power to do so. So here we are. Verse 1. And when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes follow him. This is why we know the Sermon of the Mount is now over, right? What's the first verse? From It says he is coming down from the mount. So we now know that the Sermon of the Mount is over. And another episode of Jesus' ministry is beginning. Okay? Verse 2, and behold, a leper came to him and bowed down to him. What, what did the first thing the leper did? Bow down to worship. Did he know who Jesus was? By his reaction and bowing down, he knew he was Lord. He knew he's king. Okay? He bowed down right off the bat and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Did he have any doubt? That Jesus can make him clean. We know he didn't have any doubt because he said what? If you're willing, I will be clean. Okay? So this leper believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 3. And he stretched out his hand, Jesus did, and touched him and saying, I am willing to be cleansed. This is for you and I and all people going forward. If we pray to him and say, are you willing? He may just touch you and clean you. He has the ability when he went on the cross to clean us from our sins all time. That doesn't mean that when we don't sin again, that we don't ask for forgiveness and repent again. Yes, we do. But he has the ability to clean us, to make us righteous. So he said, he stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing to be cleansed. I am willing. And then he said, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. How long did it take? Immediately. Verse four. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest and present the offering. What's going on here now? He's telling him to go to the Sadducees or the Pharisees, the priest, right? So now we're going into what? Ceremonial rituals. Okay, he's already healed. He was healed instantly. But now Jesus is saying, hey, in order to, for you to continue, 
go to and fulfill these rituals, human rituals. He says, go in there and present the offering that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So right here, what are the priests are going to do? They're going to declare ceremonial clean so the leper was able to re-enter what? Society. Because remember, when the leper had leprosy, they were cast out of the community. So now the priest is going to what? Say ceremonially that he's cleaned, and now he's allowed to come back into the community. That was the purpose for him. So do the priests have power over our lives? Well, in this case, not for cleansing, because Jesus did a cleansing. But who is allowing him back into society? The priest. The priest is saying, it's okay now for you to come back into society. You gave your donation. You've been cleansed. I am telling you, you're cleansed. I am telling the community, you're cleansed. You welcome back. That's the power of the priest that had over this individual in the community. He had nothing to do with the actual cleansing, but he did the pro what proclaiming of the cleaning or the cleansing. Okay, so that's what he did. Verse five. And when he had entered in um, Capernaum, a centurion came to him entreating him so the lepers is over jesus moved on he's into a different city now and the roman centurion came on to him in verse six he says and saying this is a centurion speaking lord my servant is lying paralyzed at home suffering great pain does a centurion have compassion for his servant okay so right now, he's really con considered the master. He's a centurion. He's got a Roman title, right? But he's also, what, a master over a servant in this case. And he's having compassion for him. He wants him healed. So he travels to who? The healer. He travels to Jesus, the son of God. He's a centurion. He's not a Jew, correct? He's a Roman centurion. So here's where the Gentile conversation comes into play. Verse 7. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. That was Jesus' response to the centurion. I will come and I will heal him. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Almost parallel to the leper. Just say the word and I will be healed. The servant, the leper said, what? If you're willing, heal me. He knew he could. Both of these, the leper and the centurion, knew that Jesus could do the healing. So they asked. Remember about in, in, in chapter 7, ask, seek, and knock, Jesus told us? Well, these two are asking Jesus for healing and cleansing. Verse, verse 9. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go. And he goes, and another come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Verse 10, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled. And he said to those who were following, and this is Jesus speaking, truly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. That is a powerful statement. Jesus came back for who? The Jews. Jews first, then the Gentiles. And Jesus now just makes a public announcement that this man's faith is what? He is such great faith with anyone. He has not found that great faith in anyone else that he's encountered so far in his ministry. Let's continue talking about faith. I want you to go to now the book of James. I want you to go to James chapter 2. This statement here is so powerful about Jesus recognizing the faith of the centurion. I want to continue about faith. So let's go to James chapter 2. We're going to pick it up with verse 14. James chapter 2 verse 14. We're going to be talking about what? Faith and works. Jesus just brought up how powerful his faith was, so let's continue with that dialogue. 
chapter 2, verse 14, and it reads, What use is it, my brethren, if a man says that he has faith? What is the stepbrother of Jesus talking about? Faith, okay? And this is approximately 20 years um, after Jesus went to the cross. He says, what use is it, my brethren, my brothers, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Big question right there. What we're talking about now, faith and what? Salvation. Okay, that's what's being done, discussed. I'm not discussing it. I am reading the scriptures that James left behind us. So it said, can that faith save him? Does that mean there's a saving type of faith? A faith that actually saves your soul. Verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do nothing to give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Question mark. Okay. This will make you think a little bit. We're going to continue with verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, what does it say? It's dead. Being by itself. So faith with no works, faith by itself is what? Dead. Verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He's connecting them. What is the evidence of somebody's faith? It's what they do with the faith. It's their works. One without the other is dead. We just read that. Okay? So James continues in verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Tonight, we're going to talk about the demon possession in chapter 8. We're going to know that they knew who Jesus was. Did that save them? Did that knowledge that he was the son of God, did that knowledge save them? Okay, we'll go back to that. But he's saying right here that even the demons, they believe, but they also shudder. Why? Because they're going to not go to heaven. Verse 20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is what? Useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? So what's justified? Simply put, justify is to declare righteous. And justification is what? An act of God whereby God pronounces us a sinner, a sinner like me, sinner like everybody else. God allows those sinners to be righteous because of what? Their belief. Father Abraham did nothing to deserve his righteousness. God granted it to him because he believed in what God said. So we become righteous when we believe that Jesus is the son of God. Verse 22, it says, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Didn't talk about the person being perfected, right? Talked about what being perfected? The faith, the actual belief that you are displaying for the Lord, for God and Jesus' his son. That's what's being perfected, not the person. We won't be perfected until when? We're in heaven, okay? And we're in our spiritual bodies. But here, the faith in itself. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Does that tell you the relationship between Abraham and God? Gives you a glimpse of what kind of relationship they have. Is that same relationship available to you and I? Can we have that same deep relationship? 
We certainly can. God encourages it. That's why he gave us this Bible, the Holy Scripture, so that we would know him. He continues. Verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works. The works in this case that are talking about is the act of what? Believing and then being obedient and not by faith alone. That's the difference. Not by faith alone. He, and why did he say that? He just mentioned the demons believed and shuddered. But are they going to heaven? No. Just because the demons believed in who they are doesn't mean they go to heaven. So belief and faith alone doesn't get you there. Does that make sense? Continuing. Verse 25, and in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way to save their lives, to continue their mission from God? And then verse 26 to finish this reading, it says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead. Let's hover there. Without the Holy Spirit inside you, what's going on with this body? Is it alive or is it dead? It's dead. The Holy Spirit is what makes it alive. And the Holy Spirit comes from where? God himself. And that's why Jesus had to ascend to the Father. So it says here, For just as the body without the Spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So I bring the book of James into this because we were talking about the centurion's faith. I wasn't even talking about it. Who was talking about it? Jesus was describing the centurion's faith. So since we were talking about faith, I wanted to take you to the book of James to let James tell you and I a little bit more about the level of faith. And that faith by itself doesn't get you into heaven. Okay? So let's go back to Matthew. We're going to pick it up with Matthew 8, and we're going to pick it up with verse 11. And then we'll have a couple more verses, and I'm going to open it up for comments. We're going to pick it up with verse 11, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 8. And it reads, And I say to you, Jesus is speaking again, And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What is he talking about here? He's talking about salvation, right? He's telling us everybody from the east and from the west, people are going to join me, right? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about salvation. And they're going to what? They're going to be at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs. In where? Where? In the kingdom of heaven. But, in verse 12, here's a but. Who's speaking? Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, but the sons of of the kings shall be cast out into outer darkness in the place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth what is jesus describing here he just described in verse 12 heaven and now he's describing hell okay this is your lord this is your savior i'm not speaking i'm reading his words okay in verse 13 and jesus said to the centurion Go your way, let it be done to you as you have what? As you believed. Because of his faith, because of his belief, his servant is healed. And then it says, and the servant was healed that very hour. So before we continue, I think this is so deep. I want to pause right here and just open it up for questions before we go on to verse 14. Okay. Okay. This is a, a deep conversation about belief and faith and, and who's teaching us. Jesus is teaching us. He's no longer on the Sermon on the Mount, okay? He is now in another transition from his teaching. But his teaching didn't stop. Just the area and who he's talking to. Go ahead, Arnie. Yeah, comment. Uh, first off, uh, he's referring to the servant of the centurion in Luke. Luke calls it a slave of the centurion and that slave was near death. I just wanted to bring that up. Um, you know, if you think about the centurion, how humble he had to be to approach Jesus. Here's a man, a centurion is a man in charge of a hundred soldiers of war. 
He's a man of war. And yet he humbled himself to go before Jesus and ask for Jesus to help him. He went before a Jew, even though the Romans at that time were occupying Jerusalem and actually beating up Jews and doing bad things to Jews. Yet this centurion loved his servant so much that he humbled himself and went before Jesus. Great point. Great. And the other question I have, the last, it says, while the sons of the kingdom are going to go into darkness, who are the sons of the kingdom? Okay. Where are they going? Well, the vernacular is they're going to hell, but uh, I'm not supposed to say that, but they're going into darkness uh, where they'll be weeping and gash, gnashing of teeth. Okay. So all those who are son of who? Are they son of God? If they were the sons of God, they would be going to heaven. So the kingdom is Satan? And those who follow Satan are going where? They're going to the fire. They're going to the fire. That's the difference. Okay. Those who, we have a choice. Do we not? We have a choice on this earth to either follow God himself or we can follow the temptations of Satan. We had that in chapter four with Jesus. Jesus resisted the temptations. Our job is to resist Satan and his temptations and not become followers of Satan. If we become followers of Satan, where are we going? To the darkness, where there's going to be what? Gnashing of feet. So you're going to be sons of who? Not God, but sons of Satan. Does that make sense? Yeah. This whole, this whole chapter had basically three lessons. Uh, and what it means to follow Jesus. You know, if you, you, if you, almost 80% of the United States people, if you ask them, they'll say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but that's nonsense, okay, in my opinion. It's more important to ask, are you a follower of Jesus? And what does it mean to follow Jesus? Lesson one in this chapter, the wisdom of God will never make sense to the world. I mean, we all ask questions. Why did you let Ukraine happen and stuff like that? We, it will never make sense. Lesson two, it's all about walking by faith one day at a time. And the last lesson in this, in this chapter is lesson three, letting go of the kinds of worldly concerns that motivate and control the people of this world and putting the kingdom of God first. That's what it means to follow Jesus, I think. Commandment number one. And so Jesus is still teaching, is he not? He's teaching the disciples and he's teaching those who are around him. And ultimately, he's teaching you and I. Okay? So when you say, yes, there's a lot of self-professed Christians. But what is the evidence of being a Christian? We just talked about it in the book of James, did we not? What is the evidence of being a Christian? If I say I'm a Christian, does that mean I'm a Christian? Speaking it doesn't mean it. That's why we took you back to James where faith in itself by it without works is what? Dead. And so it's your works. It's what your evidence is, is what comes out of your mouth and what your actions are. That's what the evidence of whether or not you're a follower. And, you know, I was asked the question by my brother. He said, you're a Christian, right? And I said, no, wrong. I'm a follower of Jesus. And he didn't understand that difference right then. That's what I mean about taking things out of context. I've been asked that question many times lately. I don't know why. Uh, are you a Christian? And I always have the same response. I'm the follower of Jesus. And if you are a follower, you should what? Proclaim it. Yep. Don't deny it. Proclaim it. You don't have to say I'm a Christian. Nope. I'm a follower of who? Of Jesus. And that alone, they will identify you as a Christian just by doing it. Anyone else have any comments? Thanks, Arnie. Okay. So a very important part of chapter eight we just reviewed. So we're going to continue. We're going to pick it up with verse 14. And this is where Peter's mother-in-law is going to be healed. 
and 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 just check out what her first response is. Okay, this is this is a lesson again for us. I mean, that's what's great about the Bible. <laughs> it keeps on telling us how we should respond and how we should act if we read it to understand it. So in verse fourteen, it reads, "And when Jesus had come to Peter's home, whose home is it? Peter. So Peter is what a, a disciple. He left the boat. He left the farmers." the business, right? But does he still have a home? Yes, he still has a home. Could be his parents' home, but they're calling it his home. So where did they go? To Peter's home. And in, in the other gospel, Andrew's involved too. It's Peter and Andrew's home, his brother. So they're at Peter's home. He saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. Who are we talking about? Who saw the mother-in-law? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus saw. So what does Jesus do in verse 15? It is written that he touched her hand. Okay, what did he do with the leper? Touched the leper, healed the leper. Jesus now has touched the hand of Peter's mother-in-law and the fever left her and she arose and waited on him. Instantaneously, what was her response? To serve Jesus. When we are touched by Jesus himself, our first response is to automatically what? Serve him for the rest of our lives. Okay? The response is the teaching here. What did she do? She got up and immediately, without thinking, started serving her Lord and Savior. Verse 16, when we go through that, that, that confession and that repentance, and we're born again, then we should be serving the Lord each and every day going forward. Verse 16 reads, And when evening had come, they brought him to many who were demon-possessed. So they left Peter's house. They went out. And people brought, what? Demon-possessed people. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. He's healing the demon-possessed. He's casting out the evil spirits. So what spirit can replace the evil spirits? Making room for the Holy Spirit to enter. Casting out the evil spirit so that the Holy Spirit would be able to enter the body. And it continues. All, and he continued and healed all those who were ill. Verse 17. Jesus is getting a lot of attention right now. Would you agree? He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's getting a lot of attention. Who is this guy? People are wondering. Verse 17. In order that was spoken through Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, saying he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. As in Isaiah 53. So that's in there. Why did Jesus do all these things? To fulfill prophecy right? It had to happen. He did it to fulfill the prophecy, which would, would lead him to be recognized as the Messiah, as the Son of God to come back. Here we go on discipleships. Now we're going to be tested, okay? Verse 18, now when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side. So there's another transition in jesus teaching right at this moment okay he told the people let's go let's go to the other side of what the other side of the lake right okay and certain scribe came and said to him teacher i will follow you wherever you go okay we know that scribes of the day usually came from what wealthy families that actually have that education to become a scribe okay so we know that that's typically where a scribe came from from a wealthy family who could afford the education so this is the type of person who is now speaking to jesus and he says i will follow you wherever you go verse 20 and jesus said to him the foxes have holes and the birds have the air and they have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head so what is he telling him? 
because I know you want to follow me, but where I go, there's not going to be comfort. It's not like you're going to be in a synagogue. It's not going to, you're going to be delivered food every day. Have someone make it for you and deliver it for you. It's not that type of lifestyle. It's a different type of lifestyle to follow me. Verse 21. And another of the disciples, how is he described? He's described as what? A disciple. Okay. And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go to bury my father. Okay. He wants to be excused for now, it sounds like. And it could be for multiple reasons. Could be that he is the oldest in the family and his father's sick and it's his responsibility to bury the father. Could be another reason. Could be that, and according to his, well, let's read his response and we'll go into other possibilities. 22, then Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. So that could be what? The dead, the spiritually dead burying the, the other spiritually dead, okay? There is no consensus that one explanation is better than the other here. There's just not enough information here to decide, but there is speculation on in different ways. There, remember, we're talking about the time that Jesus walked the earth. So this could be 30 AD, this could be 31 AD, right? And at that time, the father, the patriarch of the family was honored and the son's responsibility was to bury their father. And then if there was an estate, then it, he was an heir to that, that, that dad. And, and there came responsibilities to that. That's one way. But when Jesus says this, he's saying, I trump, if you will, tradition. Follow me like Peter did. He left the family business and immediately followed Jesus. This person didn't want to do that, did he? So there we have the response from Peter as an example. And we also have this person. And this person's considered what? A disciple all as well. Did you see that? I'm in the NSAB. He's considered a disciple in, in, in the verse. Verse 23, continue. And when he got up, got into the boat, his disciple followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm in the storm, uh, in the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, but he himself was asleep. Who's Jesus? What's Jesus doing? He's taking a nap. Okay. Now, some of us, and Arnie earlier had a question. Jesus is human and divine. Those of you who have actually had and, and, and participated in Bible studies before and taught Bible studies, is it draining? <laughs> is it draining? It certainly is draining your energy because you're giving everything you have to the Lord. The healing that Jesus did, you think it was draining for Jesus to do the healing? As a human being, I'm confident that it took something out of him when he took the leprosy of the man so he's human and he's tired and he fell asleep does that make sense continuing so jesus is asleep and they came to him and also by him sleeping is he setting it up for another test for the disciples Okay, he's setting up another test for the disciples at the same time. And they came to him and awoke him, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Are they fear for their earthly lives? Are they afraid of their flesh lives? Are we afraid of what can happen to our own flesh, right? Certainly we are. So it's no different between us and the disciples. They thought they may die right here in the storm. And who did they turn to? The Lord. They turned to the Lord. When we are afraid, what should we turn to? Or who should we turn to? The same, the Lord. That's a, that's a lesson right here. Okay? That's one of the lessons. Verse 26. He said to them, why are you timid? You men of what? Little faith. Ouch. 
that's got to cut a little bit to the disciples, okay? Ye of little faith. We just got done talking about the centurion's faith. And he said he's never seen faith like it. These disciples must have been humbled to a great extent when Jesus said that. Ye of little faith. Then he arose, Jesus rose, and rebuked the winds, the sea, and it came perfectly calm. In verse 27, and the men marveled, saying, what kind of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? I'm going to pause here. The disciples said what? Lord, but he also called him a man. What kind of man is this? You see that question? So I want to hesitate here and open it up for comments again before we go to the next section to finish up chapter 8. Arnie, go ahead. Well, I guess that was the answer to the question I asked is why did Jesus get in the boat when a crowd was coming to him? And what I guess you're saying is, well, he was exhausted at that, at that time, so he couldn't handle the crowd. He had to get in the boat and get away. Well, he's sleeping. He slept in the boat. <clears throat> yeah, I know. He slept in the boat. All right. So that's one comment. In, chapter, in verse 17, he speaks of the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah, you said that it was in 53. Uh, it's in 53, 4 and 5. 53, 4 says, surely he took up the infirmities and carried our sorrows. And 53.5 says, and by his wounds we were healed. Um, Peter, in what 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. But his wounds you have been healed. By his wounds you have been healed. Now here, the, this healed is something that we have to pay attention to. Okay. Isaiah was saying that he's taking care of our infirmities and whatnot while he is here on earth, okay? When he died on the cross, healing was our spirit. It was not our physical bodies. I, this is what I think anyway from looking it up. Um, there was a guy, H.A. Ironside, that wrote the following. The prediction of Isaiah 53, 4 was literally fulfilled in Jesus' daily ministry as he bore away the sickness and carried the infirmities of the people in his deep sympathies. It is a mistake to suppose that this prophecy refers to his atoning work on the cross. It was here on earth as he moved among suffering humanity that he bore our infirmities and took from men their diseases and pains. So it, it's basically saying that, you know, the healing that they're talking about when he died on the cross is spiritual here at healing not according to Isaiah, not according to, uh, not uh, physical healing. And then the last comment that I had was that the man that wanted to bury his father, he was Jewish. They don't wait a day or two to bury. A Jewish man dies, he's buried that same day. So this man had other plans. He was planning on going back and doing his thing, if you will, and waiting for his father to die. And he's saying to Jesus, hey, when I get done with all this stuff, I'm your man. And, and Jesus doesn't want to wait for that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I want to just kind of uh, focus on the difference between the cross and the healings that we're actually reading about right now. Okay. They are two separate things completely separate okay jesus is showing the miracles that he has what authority over the what the sea over demons he has authority over people so he's showing that his power who comes from where god himself is is going on right here he is fulfilling by cleansing them the leprosies the fevers, taking that on him. That's one thing. But when you bring in the cross, it's completely different. That's the atonement. And as a result of him, Jesus, being on the cross, that death three days later turned into what? 
resurrection. And we just celebrated not too long ago, Resurrection Sunday. That's the difference between the two. He's healing to show that he has the authority over everything and everyone. To his disciples, follow me. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. The cross, on the other hand, he beat Satan once and for all. He beat death, which means that he was physically resurrected, which tells you and I that we can believe him, that we will be physically resurrected as well. That's the difference. Make sense? Yeah, it's it, it just, you know, what they're saying in, in Isaiah. those verses I read is that exactly the same thing. But that doesn't mean you can't pray to Jesus or pray to God for some physical healing. You can still pray to him for physical healing, but he died on the cross for our spiritual healing. Correct. Because this body is going to turn into, if we're, if we what? If we believe, but it is believing alone work. We just read that, right? Faith by itself won't work. So if we have faith and works, this body will be physically, what? Resurrected. In a spiritual form. And that's what how we will trans be transported to heaven. Not in the physical body, but in that spiritual body that Arnie's talking about. Okay. Any other comments before we move on? This is a, another big section of chapter eight. Can you see his power? Can you see his teachings? He's literally teaching us, you and I, as well as the disciples that are going to be responsible for teaching everyone going forward. Okay. Was Jesus human? And was he divine all at the same time? He was. Okay. Because some people will say he wasn't. Some say he was human, and never divine at the same time. Let's continue then. Jesus is ready to cast out the demons. Verse 28. And it reads, And when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon possessed him were coming out of the tombs. So they safely made it across the, the storm of the sea, right? And now we're talking about they're on the other side. They're on the other side where the Gentiles are, okay? So physically, one side to the other side has now been completed. They get out of the boat from the storm, and what's the first thing they run into? Demons, okay? And what were they were coming out of the tombs. They were exceedingly violent, is, is the violent is what I have in mind, which is the NASB version, that no one could pass by the road, okay? Exceedingly violent, the demons were. Where were the demons? Inside human beings, right? Okay, let's not forget that. They're inside human beings. They took over that human being, and they're acting out in a very violent way. Verse 29. And behold, they cried out saying, what, we, um, what do we have to do with you, son of God? Okay. Here's a demon calling Jesus what? Son of God. Did the demon recognize his authority and where he came from? The demon did. Okay. Son of God. He called him there. Is this a moment of teaching now for the other disciples who are still around him, Do you, right? Everything that's going on is a teaching moment, not only for those disciples or the multitudes that are around Jesus, but also for you and I. So this is when James said, even the, even the devils believe, right? Did the book of James say that? We read it in chapter two. Even the devils understand that he's the son of God. And right here, conversation between them and jesus we're reading it he says you son of god have you come here to torment us before the time so the demons what do they want to do they know there's an end time do they not they know who's going to bring that end time jesus is going to bring it so they're already recognizing that so they're saying hey don't send me. There's going to be a negotiation here, right? They're going to say, don't send me to hell right now, right? 
and they're going to negotiate something. We're going to read about the negotiation here. Verse 30. Now, there was in a distance from them a herd of many swine feeding. So what do the demons really want? They don't want to be destroyed. They don't want to be tormented. They don't want to be sent to hell, right? So they say, hey, instead of you casting me out into hell and to torment me for the rest of existence, forever and ever and ever, send me to where? The swines. He goes, verse 31, and the demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. So the evil spirits want to continue to what? Be on earth, but not as the son of God, but as servants of Satan. That's what they want. They don't want their period to end right here. So they say, send me to the swine. Send me to the pigs. In verse 32, and he said to them, be gone. Be gone. Does Jesus have authority over the evil spirits, the demons. So what does he do? He sends the evil spirits into the swine, verse 32. And he said to them, be gone. And they came out and went into the swine. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished into the waters. So the pig said, what? I don't want the evil spirits in me. So we're going to commit suicide. And they <laughs> ran down. And bam, jumped off the cliff, and they all died. First group of pigs being committing suicide. So now we're gonna, now we're gonna find out what happens next to the now what human beings, right? The human beings have just been freed of what the evil spirits. Let's find out what happens. Verse thirty-three, and the herdsmen ran away and went into the city. And reported everything, including the incident of the de demons or the demonic. Verse 34 to complete the chapter. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they entreated him and, and entreated him to depart from their region. So what was more important to them? Did they celebrate? That the two people were demon free. No. Did they celebrate that Jesus, the son of God, was in their presence? No. They actually asked them what? To leave. What did they value more than the two people that had the demons in? Their supply chain. Their food. The pigs. The value of the pigs. What did they recognize more of a value, the food or the son of God who provides everything else? So when we encounter Jesus, is there anything that should be more important? When you're realizing you're having a conversation with Jesus and you want to be part of his kingdom and you want to be a follower, is there anything more important? Are pigs more important than Jesus? But did these people believe that? So here we had the Roman centurion used as, by Jesus as an example of faith, right? But we also have other Gentiles who still don't recognize or care about the Son of God and ask them to leave their region. And how does that relate to us today, ladies and gentlemen? Have we asked God to leave our region? Have we asked God to leave our families? Have we asked God to leave our churches, our government, our school systems? Have we asked him to leave? Unfortunately, we have in so many of these cases. And we have what? We have the history. And we still ask God and Jesus to leave our schools. We still ask God and Jesus to leave our government in the way we rule. That is our lesson. When you recognize the Son of Man, accept him, don't reject him. Don't reject his kingdom for this world.
So with that said, let's open up for any more additional comments or questions. Did anybody learn anything? Yes. Can you feel the love of Christ? I mean, I mean, can you just feel his love? Mm -hmm. He didn't do this for him. He did this for you and I. He did this so that we could read this thousands of years later. To know and understand him. What he has done for us in his past. What he's doing in our current lives and what he has in store for you and me in his future. In his future kingdom. He's teaching us how to be a member of heaven. And he's saying, not everybody's going to accept me, right? And he's saying, there's going to be demons that are going to get in your way. Pride's going to get in your way. The world's going to get in your way. Traditions of men are going to get in your way. But overcome all of those and become my follower. Who decides? We do. Yes, ma'am. We do. I can't decide for Howard. I can't decide for Joyce. We all make those decisions ourselves. We can be a self-professed Christian, as Arnie said earlier, right? It's easy. It's easy to say. But Jesus is going to ask, where's the evidence? Because before he told us, he even is going to tell others, I've never known you. Be gone. I've never known you. And they're going to even say, I prophesied in your name. He said, I didn't know you. And that'll be a harsh response. Because that means what? They're going to the fire. And not to the glorious kingdom of heaven that's been created for you and I. All right. Any other comments, questions? My point of all this is there's a personal relationship to have, isn't it? Jesus is telling us over and over again, realize who I am. Come closer to me. Don't go away from me. Come closer to me. And it's that personal relationship is between you and who? The, you and the Trinity. Because it impacts every one of them, right? God's your creator. Jesus is your savior, and the spirit is inside you. So your relationship is with all three of them. And it's provided out of what? Love. For God so loved the world that he allowed all this to happen. He didn't have to, but out of love he did for you and for me. All right. Any other, no other comments? Then we'll close in a prayer. Thank you so much for your study and your outline and the time that you spent bringing us this message tonight. It's clear. Very clear. Okay. But what I want you to leave here tonight is I want you to feel it. I want you to feel it. I don't want you just to read it. You read these words before. I want you to feel these words. Okay. Because. I to, go ahead, Arnie. I just wanted to thank you also, Terry. Uh, I know you put a lot of work into this. And I want to thank all the rest of the people that are attending for putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we know, based off of what Arnie said earlier today about his brother. He's wise. He knows the scripture, but he doesn't feel anything. Satan, did Satan know the scripture? Yeah. I'm not making a comparison. Okay, I'm not. But I'm just giving, does Satan know the scripture? He certainly does. But does he have any feeling towards God? Not anything to do with love, just the opposite. Because he's jealous and envious of God because he wanted to be God. So knowing the word in of itself, the faith doesn't do it. You have to feel it. You know what else, Terry? Yes, my sir. Brother does, my brother does good works. 
constantly. He does good works, but he doesn't have the faith. I will tell you, he was at a uh, pizza place <clears throat> and this overweight girl served him. And he felt bad for her because she was working hard and she was way overweight, could hardly walk. About a week or two later, he was at Walmart and he saw this same girl working at Walmart. And he asked her, did you leave the pizza place? And she said, no, I have to work the two jobs. Uh, you know, I'm a single mother. My brother went out to the car that day and wrote her a check for $5,000 and handed it to her with no thought of ever seeing her again, but just in order to help somebody in need. So, I mean, he's doing good works. I wish he had the faith also. Sounds like another prayer request. Yeah. Uh, the three things you can't separate, faith, works, and love. It's all one. Without one or the other, you don't have no, you don't have either. We already addressed, I think it was last week, right? Can we love one another without the love of God in us? It's, nope. nearly, it's impossible. We have to have God's love in us in order to love one another. We can say, we can talk about love. We see protesters talking about love all the time, but they're not really what? Loving. Their actions don't match the word love. So they are combined, all three of them. And the book of James said the two for sure, but everything is motivated out of what? Love. So as Marvin said, all three are inseparable. All three are inseparable. What bonds us? One of the things that bonds us here tonight. Love. Zoom. <laughs> Yes, it's Zoom, but it's, I think, Joyce, she said love, right? It's love of Jesus. It's love of God. And it's that love that bonds us that allows us to love one another. Without it, what do you have? Emptiness. They're combined. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to close this up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, our Lord, our Savior. We look forward to the day of seeing him in his glory. Father, we appreciate having the word, your love letter, saved for thousands of years so we, we can read it, study it, share it, understand it, discuss it. What a great privilege you have given us, being able to read Jesus' words in the red letters. Father, we ask you to give us the courage and strength to continue to speak his name in a world that no one wants to hear the name of Jesus because they're rejecting him as an authority over all. But give us that authority, Father. Give us the, this courage to speak his name in all our circles, in all our areas of influence, the people that we run into. Father, you have created us in your image. And we should walk proudly in that fact. Give us the strength to make the right decisions and to resist the temptations of this world. I lift up everyone here tonight, Father. They're your sons. They're your daughters. They all want to meet you face to face. They all want to bask in your glory. They all want to see your son at your right hand. So there is going to be a judgment day. May we be able to see the light. And may we spend our time here on earth helping those who are in darkness to see the light as well. So we lift up those who understand who Jesus may be, but don't feel it. We lift up those tonight in this world that don't even understand Jesus, don't want to try to understand Jesus, and don't want to understand you, Father, because they're following Satan. They're following the world and the pleasures of this world. So, Father, help us, encourage us to do what is right in your eyes. And continue to open up our brains and give us your wisdom. And we can lead it out here with the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us. So, Father, as a humble servant who loves you, I say these and I lift up these people. And I'm, may you honor these prayer requests. Lead us, guide us, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Terry. Tracy, thank, thank you. you, too. I know you help. Yes, Tracy. Nice.
Good to see you're glad you got your strength back and you're healthy. Thank God. Yes, <laughs> me too. Yes, ma'am. And then um, Tracy, I will end up uh, sending out a, maybe another prayer request. And, um, and Arnie, your brother's name is Ernest, right? Okay, will do. Yes, correct. God bless you all. We'll see you next Tuesday. God willing. Thank, Thank you, dear. Thank you all.